we are going to look at the enamine formation from an aldehyde or ketone and a secondary amine. Now I'm going to be consistent with what I've done in the other mechanism videos that I've made and we're going to continue to use acetone as our example molecule. And this time what you're going to find on the arrow is a secondary amine. It can be a symmetrical or an asymmetrical amine. In other words, you can have the same group, same carbon group on either side of the nitrogen or different ones. I'm going to make it simple for myself and I'm going to have two of the same carbon groups attached to my tertiary, or sorry, my secondary amine. So I'm going to have dimethylamine. The one difference between this one and the imine formation is that you do not maintain the pH between 4 to 5 here. We don't want this solution to be acidic because later on during the course of the reaction we actually need to produce a hydroxide ion. And if you were in acidic conditions, you would not have the ability to produce a hydroxide ion. In addition, we also want to make sure that this nitrogen's lone pair does not become protonated. So this would be the set of conditions that we have. Now initially this reacts exactly like we saw with the imine reaction. The steps are exactly the same. The nitrogen acts as the nucleophile towards the carbonyl carbon and because you can't have five bonds to carbon you break the pi bond between carbon and oxygen and oxygen being the more electronegative of those two elements takes the electrons in the bond. And this will result in a tetrahedral intermediate with charge separation. And what we do here is the same as we've done in many other mechanisms. We're going to do a proton transfer through solvent from the nitrogen to the oxygen. And our solvent in this case is most likely going to be the amine. It will do the job we need it to do. So first off we're going to show this proton transfer to the solvent molecule. The nitrogen acts as an electron pair donor and will pick up this proton. As it occurs, the nitrogen-hydrogen bond breaks and nitrogen takes those electrons with it. This is an equilibrium step. It can go forwards and backwards. It doesn't matter which of these two nitrogens really has the proton, but to do productive chemistry we want to show it going to the solvent. Alright, so this is what you get after the proton transfer to the solvent. Now we need to do a proton transfer from the solvent. So the proton on the protonated nitrogen will now be transferred to the oxygen with the negative charge. So this oxygen acts as an electron pair donor, picks up the proton, and then the nitrogen-hydrogen bond breaks and nitrogen picks up these electrons. This is also an equilibrium step. And this will give us the neutral tetrahedral intermediate with no charges anywhere. And what we make by doing this is the carbonyl amine. We saw the same intermediate when we did imine bond formation. It's exactly the same as we saw previously.
The big difference in this particular case is we used a secondary amine instead of a primary amine. So the nitrogen on the tetrahedral intermediate no longer has any protons that we can transfer over to the OH group. It, it's not an option. And so what happens here is the slow step of the mechanism. You're actually going to kick out a hydroxide at this point. And that's, as you know, not a good leaving group. It's a horrible leaving group. But it's the best we can do under the circumstances. And normally you do not create a strong base from a weak base. But there is no other way for this reaction to proceed in a forward direction. So it does occur. Now, in this slow step, the nitrogen acts as the electron pair donor to make the carbon-nitrogen double bond. And since you cannot have five bonds to a carbon, you need to break one of the sigma bonds. You wouldn't want to break them to the other carbons because then you'd make a carbanion, and those are stronger bases than hydroxide. So if a bond must break, it has to be the carbon-oxygen bond, and by induction that bond is polarized toward the oxygen since the oxygen is more electronegative. This is the slow step of this reaction. And it does favor this tetrahedral intermediate. So when this has occurred, oops, wrong color. When this has occurred, you have a pseudocarbonyl compound. It does have resonance. This is the predominant resonance structure because here everybody has got an octet. That is the other resonance structure. And you also have a hydroxide at this moment in time in solution to balance the charge. Now hydroxide, as you know, is a strong base. And this is chemically very unstable. So what is going to happen is you need to remove a proton. And the most acidic protons are the protons that are on the carbons adjacent to what was the carbonyl carbon. So if you had an asymmetrical ketone, you could get two different products here. I used a symmetrical ketone so that we won't have that issue. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to draw out the hydrogens on one of these alpha carbons so that we can look at them a little more closely as this next step of the reaction occurs. And again, you could have done this from the other side. There's no reason why it wouldn't occur there. The hydroxide is going to remove a proton. And these protons are a little bit more acidic just due to their location. They're not extremely acidic. They tend to range right around 20-ish in terms of their pKa. So hydroxide will come in here and remove one of these protons. And again, it could have been the other side as well. It just needs to be one of those adjacent to the pseudocarbonyl carbon. And as it removes the proton, carbon is the more electronegative atom in the carbon-hydrogen bond, and so carbon will get this pair of electrons. It will use them to make a carbon-carbon double bond. And as that is occurring, carbon says, hey, I can't have 10 electrons, so I need to break a bond. The pi bond is the most um, labile, and nitrogen will take those electrons toward itself. If you want to show this from the other resonance structure, that is fine. Let me just erase some of this so I can show you how to do that from the other resonance structure. But again, the one on the left is a little better because it is the predominant resonance structure. So if you want to do it from here, you'd have the hydroxide again remove the proton on the alpha carbon. Carbon-hydrogen bond would break, making pi bond, and you wouldn't need to break a pi bond since the carbon would need that fourth bond. And this can also go backwards and forwards, but it does tend to favor the forward direction.
right, so at the end we've made the enamine. As you can see, it has the double bond adjacent to the amine component. So what was the carbonyl carbon? This was the carbonyl carbon from acetone. It is then bound, doubly bound, to one of the adjacent carbons. That's where the ene part comes from. And it is also bound to the nitrogen. So it's an ene amine.